You know, I, I suspect in heaven, in just a few more minutes, God time. <laughs> That's right. That's right. A hundred year old lifespan is only about two and a half hours from his perspective. A thousand years being as a day to him. And so in just, uh, I mean, a lot of us have already lived an hour, hour and a half. <laughs> is that right? Of our two and a half. That's if you make it to a hundred. A hundred plus. Well, that means in probably an hour or so, we'll all be with him. I, 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 do, I do think that everybody on the planet has so little time compared to what they think they have. Very, 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 very soon we're going to be out of here. It's coming and going so quick. But I, I suspect we'll get to worshiping God and it'll be so powerful and it'll go so long. We may go for years. Is that right? And just caught up in the glory of God. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, we can't. That his presence manifested. We get a first fruit of it. We get a foretaste of it. But to be right in front of the throne. And since the glory that is there, uh, we have something to look forward to, saints. We really do. And it's going to be all of us and everybody else that knows him down here and all that are already there and the generations that have gone before. I mean, you might have your hands up. Just worshiping God. You might sing the same song, How Great Thou Art, but I suspect it'll have a lot more punch. <laughs> and you look over and you're rubbing shoulders, you look over and there's Moses singing right beside you. You say, oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Or David or, or Paul. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Turn please in the scriptures to verses that we've looked at previously in this meeting, 2 Corinthians, the second chapter. Let me say again, thanks to the Lord, to your pastors, Brother John and Michelle and all the great staff and everybody here. We've been treated so, so kindly and so nice. And I rejoice and I, I marvel at how good God is to you here in Cranberry. Hmm? I think if anybody had any questions or doubt about God moving and the manifesting of the Spirit and faith in the Northeast, uh, they're being put to rest. God is powerful. Hallelujah. And He's powerful right here. Is that right? He's powerful right here. And uh, the Lord has blessed you, hasn't He? Got this great fine facility and this prime property and how many believe he's not through blessing you? He's not, he's not done. He has uh, more. And you know, the, when you find out what the next part is, it always challenges your faith. It always not. When you find out the next part of the plan of God, it's not like, oh yeah, we got that in the account. We'll just take care of that by Wednesday. And no, no problem. No, no, that's not how it works. When he shows you what his next part is, you're going to go, whoo. We ain't never been there before. Never believed for that much before. Never. That's the way it always is. But to him, it doesn't look big. It just looks big according to your faith and to your vision. But aren't you glad you didn't stop somewhere 10 years ago? Huh? And we'll be glad that we didn't stop and that we'll go all the way with him. In 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, and the 11th verse, he made this statement, he said, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. A lot of revelation there, like in every verse. Obviously, we have an enemy. Satan is real. And he can have an advantage over believers. He's writing to the Christians, the saints at Corinth. Tongue talkers. And uh, 
we see that what gave him, he has devices, certain ways of operation, things he uses, and he doesn't need to change them up generation to generation because, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, every generation comes in ignorant. Is that right? And either learns or doesn't learn. And most, uh, it's sad that a lot of things are lost generation to generation. And the next generation kind of has to start over. Sometimes things are lost and for a whole generation or two or three. But uh, it's that ignorance of the enemy and how he works that gives the enemy an advantage over people. One of his favorite tactics is getting people to believe there is no devil, which allows him to just work unresisted. But then among believers and those who do know that the Bible is right, that there is an enemy, there is a devil, he does have tactics and devices. You'll see over in the 11th chapter another main strategy that he employs. 2 Corinthians 11 and 13. He said, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, verse 14, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. If you do understand the truth that there is a devil, that there is an adversary, then one of the, one of the ways he'll try to work with you is he will, he will not come at you as the devil. He will come at you trying to convince you that he's from God. That he is God or a messenger sent from God. And he brings thoughts and he brings feelings and he brings revelations. And uh, if we don't know the word and don't know the spirit of God, then we again will be at a disadvantage. I know uh, we were just uh, ministering on this just a few days ago on the subject from John 10 where Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. My sheep know my voice. And a stranger's voice they won't follow. And I remember when I was a, a teenager and begin in my late teens and begin to realize that God was dealing with me about something. I didn't know I had a call on my life. I didn't know I was supposed to be in the ministry. That was a foreign concept to me at that time. But I knew God was trying to communicate with me, and I uh, wasn't getting it. Being natural, you try to hear God naturally. You want to see and feel things in this realm, and, and God's a spirit. And uh, finally, I won't go through all the details, but after months of uh, seeking him and not getting there, I must have asked him a thousand times, well, God, talk to me. Talk to me. What, what is it? What, what do you want me to see? What do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? Talk to me. Talk to me. And uh, finally, thank God, kneeling by our little couch in our home, I remember distinctly I was saying again, God, talk to me. And thank God in, inside in my spirit, begin to come up to my mind, to illuminate. I didn't hear an audible voice, but distinctly in my, in my heart, the Lord spoke to me and said, Son, Keith, he said, uh, and he, he drew my attention to a Bible laying on the table that had been laying there <laughs> unopened for some time. He said, Son, I have already said many things to you in the book. Find out what I've already said to you in the book. And if I want to say something else to you, I will. <laughs> now that sounds <laughs> humorous. It sounds like something you already know. But it took me a, a number of years to begin to realize why he said that and what that meant. There are some things you can't find that I wouldn't have found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John like Go to Ramah. Huh? Serve Brother Hagin's ministry for extra amount of years. And, 
and then af things after that. I mean, that's, that's not in there. Not just like that. So why would he say that to me? Because I didn't realize that that's the process of how you get to know his voice. How many of you, there are certain people, could call you on the phone, and it could be a lousy connection, and they could say one word, and you know who it is. You know who it is. Why? Why would you know who it is? Because you have heard that voice day in, day out, year after year, when they were happy, when they were sad, when they were mad, right? You, you have heard that voice so many ways and so long that you know it when you hear it. And you're not laboring trying to figure out, is this them? You know instantly. And uh, if somebody tried to uh, mimic them or imitate them, they might fool somebody who doesn't know that person, but when you hear them, you know, oh, no, no, that's not them. That's what Jesus is saying. My sheep know my voice, and a stranger's voice they won't follow. And what I didn't realize is what he was telling me. Get in the book, son. Why? Because I'm hearing his voice in Genesis. Even though it's a different human author, I'm hearing the same voice in verse Kings. And I'm hearing that same voice in Matthew. Come on, can you see this? And I'm hearing that same voice in 1 Corinthians and that same voice in the book of Revelation. And as I get familiar with his voice through all these different human vessels, same voice, then if, when he speaks to me about something else by his spirit, I'll recognize it. That's the same one speaking to me through this book. And then if the enemy tries to fool me, Come on, are y'all with me now? And tries to tell me this is God telling you something, I'll recognize that it's not him. Because it doesn't sound like Matthew. It doesn't sound like Romans. It doesn't sound like Galatians. It doesn't sound like this. It doesn't sound like the Psalms. It's a different voice. If you want God to talk to you, it's not complicated. Hmm? Pull out your Bible. Turn to any page. Say, God, speak to me. And start reading. In faith. That's him. That's him speaking to you. And the more familiar you are with his voice in the written word, the harder it'll be for the enemy to trick you or deceive you or mislead you on anything. The more ignorant you are of what he said in his word and his voice speaking to you, then the enemy has an advantage over you and can employ this device of coming across as an angel of light and telling you this is God, this is God, and it's not God. It's not God. How many know there are many voices in the world? None of them without signification. All of them got something to say. And there's, there are things that are spiritual and things that are real, but that doesn't make it God. Doesn't make it God. I had a I had a fellow one time was taking me to task about something I had preached and taught. And he said, well, I, I, can't, I can't accept that. I can't accept that because. And he began to explain this experience that he had. That an angel in white had, had appeared to him and shown him some things. And while a lot of people, you know, say things like that, and it's just their imagination, they just made it up. While he was saying that, the Lord prompted me. He said, he did see it. He did see something. But it wasn't me. Isn't that something? Well, we've got scripture for it, doesn't it? The enemy transforms himself. How many know you need to be strong in the written word of God? And I don't care if a 40-voice angelic choir descends through your ceiling tomorrow morning as you're waking up. <laughs> and they sing to you in heavenly harmonies with a light show. If anything they tell you is in disagreement with half of a verse anywhere in this book, you just laugh at it and say, no, I'm not accepting any of that. It can be real. It can be spiritual. And that doesn't make it God. So he said we're not ignorant of his devices. Look with me, please. Over in... Tell you what, go to Mark, 
the first chapter, and uh, I'll just begin to share some of this before we read our verse. You're going to Mark 1. We mentioned to you that there are things that are revelations that people have that sound good, but it's not God. And we mentioned one, one of them, God is in control. Sounds good, and it depends on what you're talking about as to whether that's right or wrong, but if you're leaving the impression that everything that happens is God and God is controlling everything and everybody, then that is absolutely a doctrine of devils. That is contradicting many, many scriptures all through the Word. We also mention this one. Let go and let God. <laughs> now I'm just mentioning a couple of these. How many know there's a bunch of these? that are well-known phrases and broadly accepted in the body of Christ and treated like scriptures, treated like Bible. But is that Bible? Where is that verse? Let go and let God. Is that a scripture? Is that a verse? If you're, if you're in trying to imply, you know, cast all your cares over on the Lord and rest in Him and don't try to accomplish it by your, your works and, and just everything that you can do, certainly there's truth there. But if you leave the idea that we just need to get out of the way and let God do it because it's, it's all Him and it's none of us, that is also a doctrine of devils. It's not true. He has, the Lord has ordained that he has a part and we have a part. And we are laborers together with him. And if we don't do our part, he's got nothing to bless. It's not all God. And even though he has provided everything that we need by his great grace, none of it will be enjoyed unless we appropriate it with our faith. And if you try to make it all, it's all up to God, it's all up to God, then you're going to miss out and you're going to wait and things are not going to happen and they're not going to happen and they're not going to happen. The key to miracles is what Jesus' mother told him at the wedding feast of Canaan. Whatever he says to you, do it. So when the Lord told him, go fill the water pots with water, now, is it up to God? Huh? Are they waiting on God? Is it a coincidence that the miracle of the water becoming wine happened the moment they did what he told them to do? It's no coincidence. When you act in faith, the power is released. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you do your part, his part manifests. It's not, it's not all up to God. It's not all up to him. Here's a, another thing that I want us to touch on tonight. I was watching a, a, a talk show some uh, years ago, and a, a very well-known minister of God was on the talk show. And, and I don't know this person personally, but I think very highly of them. And I think God has used them and is amazingly. But the commentator, who I don't, doesn't, doesn't sound to be a believer at all, was questioning him. And then at different times he wanted him his, what his position was on certain issues. And so... Uh, this, uh, this commentator said to this minister, he said, uh, well, you know, Jesus preached love and acceptance. And he's talking about a certain, uh, some certain lifestyles that much of the church does not accept and condone. 
He said, but if you act like Jesus, then you love people and you accept people as they are. And the pastor nodded his head and went, yeah, yeah, you know, that's right. Jesus preached love and acceptance. And when he said that, the Lord spoke up to me and said, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. That's not what I preached. <laughs> so, I began to put my nose back in the Bible. What did he preach? <laughs> Do you see why we're talking about these things? Hmm? Because most folks would just swallow that. And have, well, yeah, yeah. That's what Jesus preached. Love everybody, accept everybody. That's what he preached. Did you go to Mark? You got what people think? And then you got what the Bible says. Mark 1, 14. And after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching. What was he preaching? The good news about the kingdom of God. That sounds almost like a foreign phrase to a lot of Christians. <laughs> That's what he preached. And he was saying, it gives you further detail about what he was preaching. He said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, Jesus preached the gospel, the, which means good news, the good news about the kingdom of God. He preached repentance and he preached faith. Is that the same as love and acceptance? Hmm? Let's just take these two words. Is acceptance the same as repentance? <laughs> Do you see this, friends? Do you see how subtle the enemy is? How subtle he, wor he works. It sounds good. Jesus loves everybody. Jesus accepts everybody. Jesus preached love and acceptance. And if you're like Jesus, that's what you do too. What scriptures are you using? What scriptures are those? And what a lot of times the reason why it even comes up is people are demanding that you accept their ungodly life or their ungodly ways. Accept it. When Jesus didn't, preach acceptance he preached repentance and repentance now has become so politically incorrect that even in parts of the church people are, are, are doing away with the idea of repentance no 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 there's no need to repent or they have reduced it to only a change of thinking This, friends, is a big mistake. I said, this is a big mistake. And it is contrary to the Word of God. Tell me what Jesus preached. Gospel about the kingdom or the reign of God. And what did he say? Repent and believe. He preached faith. You know he preached faith. All things are possible to him that believes. Is a quote from who? Jesus. We looked at people repeated and he said, if you can believe, all things are possible to those that believe. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you whole. Great is your faith. What did Jesus emphasize? Accepting everything everybody's doing. No. And as far as the love... He didn't so much preach it as he commanded it. <laughs> he commanded us to love each other. Now that's your brother. 
as he has loved us. And he already said God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The reason I'm touching on some of these things is not to just try to be a, a stickler about a definition or a word. How many can see the enemy is very crafty? He's very deceptive in the way he comes across. And we should not let unbelievers tell us what Jesus preached. Amen. Folks that don't even believe in God will tell you they're not a Christian. And then they're going to tell us what Jesus preached and how, what we're supposed to believe and what we're supposed to do. How would they have a foggy clue? <laughs> the disciples preached. Mark 6, 12, you don't have to turn there. But the disciples went out and preached that men should repent. In the book of Acts, how many believe in the book of Acts? That's us. We're still writing the book of Acts. Is that right? Acts 2.38, Peter preached, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Is repentance a New Testament concept? Hmm? <laughs> Is there a place for believers to repent? Hmm? Well, we're going to look at some scriptures. We'll see what we think after the, after the verses. Go to 2 Peter 3. We, want to, we need to define repentance some. And then we need to look at what the scripture says about it. And then we need to see what, how much of it we need to do. In 2 Peter, 2 Peter, 3rd chapter, 9th verse, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering to us word. And, and in, in this understanding is what we touched on about a day with the Lord being like a thousand years. Um, you know, we all want the Lord to come back. And he is coming back. And we might think we want him to come right now. But if he waits another day from his perspective, you're talking about millions saved that wouldn't have been. Are y'all with me? So he knows when to come, right? <laughs> he, and verse, verse 9, the rest of it, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance is the answer from perishing. It is the way not to perish. Repentance is one of the most wonderful things you've ever heard about or known about. And to speak disparagingly of it and to have a low esteem of it and to try to say it doesn't apply to believers anymore is believing something that came from the enemy. Because who was it? Who, it, who would it be that wants you to not have an out from destruction. It would be the destroyer. Let me say it like this. I believe the Lord gave me this phrase. Sin is the devil's way in. Repentance is our way out. Out of the problem. Out of destruction out of judgment. In, uh, go with me to 2 Timothy, please, the second chapter. 2 Timothy 2. Is 2 Peter in the, in the New Testament, does that belong to believers? Is 2 Timothy written to believers? 
all the epistles are written to believers. Don't let somebody tell you they're not. James is written to believers. 1 John is written to believers, all of it, to believers. If you have a wrong doctrine, one of the first problems you'll encounter is you'll run into passages of scriptures that don't agree with it. So what you have to do is either flat out reject the Bible or you have to say it's either passed away or it's not for us. Are y'all with me, friends? But if you just open your eyes and just read the, the text, you'll see these, these writings are for believers. They talk about faith in Jesus. In 2 Timothy 2 and 24, 2 Timothy 2, 24, he said, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach and patient. Verse 25, in uh, humility, correcting those who are, who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Did you hear that word grant? Repentance is a gift. It's a gift. And if you read the next verse, so that what? That they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. Can a believer be deceived? Can a believer come into some different degree of captivity through their flesh and wrongdoing and wrong believing? Hmm? Is there a way out of that captivity? Yes. What did the Bible say it is? Repentance. It's one of the most glorious things you've ever heard of. Sin is the devil's way in. It's his way into your life. That's why the scripture said, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But what if you submit yourself to the enemy? Well, then he has access. That's why the Bible said neither give place to the enemy. If he has place in our life, it's because we gave it to him, ignorantly or otherwise. And if he has place in our life, what's he going to do? He's going to steal, he's going to kill, he's going to destroy. And we don't have to look around to see if a believer can fall and miss it. Hmm? Believers have fallen all around us, messed up, made mistakes. And you can get in a place where you've messed things up so bad. Is there a way out? I said, is there a way out? Yes. Even if other people have, are done with you, if they've had it with you, is there a way out? It is repentance. Oh, hallelujah. It's repentance. Through repentance, you can escape the snare of the enemy. Oh, somebody say, I believe it. If you do. Let me read this, this to you from the, uh, the Living Bible. Verse 26 says, if God, the other verse had said, if God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. See, uh, this, this goes hand in hand with what Jesus said, the truth will make you free. You're acknowledging the truth. Verse 26, the living Bible, then they will come to their senses and escape from Satan's trap of slavery to sin, which he uses to catch them whenever he likes. And then they can be do, begin doing the will of God. If you look up the words repent, there's more than one and there's a number of verses that give you the meaning of what, what they are. But 
If you put them together, it means to turn, to turn away from something, to turn to something. One of them means to feel remorse. And above all, they all mean to change. Somebody say change. Change. And most of all, it is a heart change. Not just a change of thinking. It's a change of heart. How many know that you could mess up and feel bad because you got caught? Hmm? And out of embarrassment, weep prolifically. That doesn't mean you've repented. Right? You cried. You confessed after you got caught. Huh? You feel bad. You're upset. You're angry. You're hurt. You're ashamed. None of that's repentance. You can cry all night long and not repent. You can heave and carry on. Tell me what it means to repent. What does it mean to repent? Bottom line is you change. You change in your heart. And you say, that's not for me. This is for me. Right? You change in your heart. Hallelujah. That God may grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the enemy. Does that sound good to you? Recover themselves. I mean, that, recover yourself, that means nobody has to pray for you. Nobody, you don't, nobody has to do anything. Just through repentance, you can be completely set free. Completely delivered. Now, uh, some might say, well, but Brother Keith, there's no need to repent because Jesus has already paid the price for all of our sins. And what is there to repent for? I'll just touch on this and this. As you can tell, these are big subjects. Obviously, we can't cover everything in detail in a few minutes. But it's the spirit of a thing that you can pick up and get in your heart. And if you'll be honest, you've got the Holy Spirit in you, you know what's right. It'll bear witness with your spirit. And, of course, it'll be all through the Word of God. Uh, There are two things that are required. Two main things to live condemnation free. Not just one. Two main things. Number one is faith in the precious blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Faith in what Jesus did when he took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses and carried our pains and took the full brunt of our judgment. And so from mistakes that you've made in the past or something that you did today, we need to have faith that if we uh, confess it, if we repent and we receive our forgiveness and cleansing, He is faithful, hallelujah, and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And yes, that belongs to Christians. Yes, it does. 1 John 1, 9 belongs to believers. Uh, Unsaved people don't need to confess a sin. They need to confess Jesus as Lord of their life. They don't need, you don't need to be talking about fellowship and walking in the light with Him. They're outside the covenant. They're dead. And if you miss it, that doesn't change the fact that Jesus already paid for all your sins. And it doesn't 
disassociate you from your relationship as his child. What it does do is interfere with your fellowship with him. Just like with a human being. If you wrong somebody in your relationship, that doesn't mean just like that. You're no longer their spouse or you're no longer their child. Doesn't mean they don't love you anymore automatically. But could it interfere with your fellowship with them? Could it affect your communion with them? Yes. That's where repentance comes in. You can get it right. No, you didn't stop being his child. He didn't stop being your father. No, it didn't change the fact that Jesus already paid the price for that sin, any, one, any of them that you would ever commit. But there's two things, two big keys to live in condemnation free. Go to Romans 8, please. We'll give you the second one. There are two phrases that are quoted a lot. There is, therefore, now no condemnation. Another one is, we're not under the law. Both of these are half verses. They are not the complete verse. Both of these phrases are half verses. Let's look at the entire verse. You want to? Romans 8 and verse 1. What does it say? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, period. No. Who what? Do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now if you say, well, hold on, Brother Keith, that's not in some manuscripts. I knew you might say that. If you skip down to verse 4, just a couple of verses later, he says it again, that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us. Who what? Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is the second element of living condemnation free. Number one, we must have faith in the precious blood of Jesus to cleanse us and wash us from all sin and all unrighteousness. But that is not the only truth. That's not it, period. Some have tried to imply that and say, that's all there is. And if, you, if you've messed up, the, the only thing you have to deal with is for you to get rid of your sin consciousness. And just, just realize you are the righteousness of God in Christ and, and, and there is no condemnation. And if you've messed up terribly, the only thing you need to do, you don't need to repent. The sin's already been paid for. It's already been done. Uh, all you need to do is just get rid of the sin consciousness. Not true. I said not true. You will never, if that's all you do, you will never walk condemnation free. You'll try to kid yourself and you'll con yourself. What else must you do? You must walk in the light that you have. You must do what you know to do. That's not you doing works trying to be justified. That's you walking in the light. What will happen if you don't? If you don't do what you know to do, or if you violate your conscience and do what you know you're not supposed to do, your heart will condemn you. Not the Holy Spirit. Your own heart will condemn you and you will not be able to get rid of it no matter how many times you confess I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Are y'all with me, friends? 
you have to do what you know to do to get your own heart to stop condemning. And if our heart, 1 John said, if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask of Him, we receive. Hallelujah. We're free from condemnation. We're free from sin consciousness. And our faith and confidence rises up. And our boldness rises up. So what do you do if you violated light? You repent. <laughs> That's what you do. You come before the Lord. You acknowledge to Him, I knew better. You can't con Him about what you see and didn't see. He's the one showed you what you saw. <laughs> right? Any light that you have, He was there when you got it. Right? You can't say, I just didn't know, and it was just so big, and it just all overwhelmed me, and I just said, oh, nobody helped me. I tried to get them to help me, and that's not repenting. That's making excuses. That's blame shifting. That's, huh? What's repenting? I'm wrong. I knew better. There's no excuse. Hmm? And, uh, I have it in my heart to do differently, hmm? to be different, to do different. Look in Hebrews, if you would. Hebrews. Y'all believe it with me this evening? Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. 26. If we sin willfully after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, let's just stop right here. What, what did, does repentance involve? That God would grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. If we sin willfully after we've received knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be worthy who's trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. This and other scriptures answer the question and issue about once saved, always saved. So what about it? Can a person be lost after they have been saved? The Bible very clearly says so. But it's only if a person comes to the place where they no longer respect the blood of the Lamb. If somebody has done this kind of thing, it's not that God wouldn't forgive them. If you look at the other scriptures, it says you can't get them to repent. You cannot renew them again to repentance, Hebrews says. What does that mean? It means you could go to them and say, look, come get back with God and you come get right with God. And they might curse and go, I don't have any need for all that Jesus junk and all that church junk. And, and you would not be able to get them to repent. In that case, it's possible a person who had been saved would now wind up lost. But it's real simple. If you want to be right with God, you ain't lost. I mean, you're not going to be. Anybody want to be right with God? Do you want to be? Do you want to be? Well, how many understand? He, he talked here about them doing despite to the spirit of grace and counting the blood of the covenant an unholy thing. There, there's, some, there's some lightness in our generation that needs to be corrected. Even if you believe in 1 John 1, 9, sometimes people say, have the ideas, well, uh, yeah, we all mess up. We all sin every day. And, you know, I, man, I sinned a lot yesterday. I'm sure I'll sin a whole lot today before the day's over. And, and we're just 1 John 1, 9, it, no big deal. <laughs> I 
I know it sounds funny, but it's not. Because what did it cost? I said, what did it cost to get us the right to be cleansed and washed and even after breaking our fellowship with him to be able to be restored and be clean as if we had never even made a mistake? What did that cost? We really don't know how much it cost. But it cost the lifeblood of the precious spotless Lamb of God. And it's only by that blood that speaks on the mercy seat right now that we have access to the Father. It's only by that blood that we can be clean. It's only by that blood that we can be righteous. So to treat sin as trivial and insignificant is also to treat what it took to pay for it trivial and insignificant. Nothing funny about sin. Nothing light and frivolous about sin. And it's not true. You don't have to sin every day. You can go all week and not sin one time. I guess not everybody believes that, huh? <laughs> what is sin? So we have to we're still dealing with stuff that has come through revelations that didn't come from God. Whole denominations and groups and sects have developed books and writings that have categorized sins and uh, some were uh, mortal sins and some weren't so bad and, and this and that and the other. But that's not, that's not what the Bible teaches at all. Let me give you a very simple definition of sin. Violation of light. Light is what you see. It's what you know. Anybody remember James 4.17? You don't have to turn there. They'll put it on the screen for us. James 4.17, what does it say? Therefore, to him that knows to do good, and what? Does it not? Read the next two words. Read the next two words. To him. Why to him? Is sin not the same for everybody? Actually, no. I mean, right is right. Wrong is wrong. That doesn't change. But what God holds us accountable for is only what he knows we know. Isn't he good? Isn't he merciful? And if you walk in, I mean, some folks have implied that 1 John might not be for us. Oh, dear me. You better hope it is. 1 John talks about if we walk in the light as he is in the light, how is an unbeliever hadn't been born again going to walk in the light with Jesus? As we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What does that mean? If you just do what you know, all the stuff you don't know, the blood takes care of it. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But as soon as you see something else and you understand it and you know it, now you're accountable to walk in the light of that, right? To do what you know. And if you don't do it, then you sin. And yes, Jesus has already paid for it, but that's not the only thing that's the issue. The issue is if you purposely choose to ignore light God has given you, you're rebelling against him. Your love for him is not what it should be. You love something else, in this case, more than you do him. This affects your fellowship with him. He, he hadn't disowned you. You're still his child. But your fellowship, just like if you wrong a, a human being, you're going to need to talk to him. 
You're going to need to see. I mean, they're going to want to know if you really did something to wrong them. They're going to want to know if you plan on doing it again tomorrow. Right? Or if you're, if you're going to change. And if they're God-like, if your heart's right and you genuinely change, they'll forgive you. Fellowship can be restored, good as it ever was, or better. Come on, can you see this, friends? None of this changes the fact that Jesus already paid for your sins. We said two big things necessary to live condemnation free. Tell me what they are. Help me out. Tell me. Faith in the precious blood of the Lamb. But is that all? No, I mean, it sounds good to say that's all. That's, that's everything. Well, no, you've got to receive it and respond to it. What's the other part? Walk in the light. We said, you know, people say, I'm not under the law, not under the law. That's a quote from different verses. That's half of a verse in Galatians that says, if you be led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. If you're led by the Spirit, you don't want to speak derogatorily of the law. You don't want to speak derogatorily of the Ten Commandments. Hmm? I mean, if I'm not going to be Spirit-led, you'd probably prefer it if I was led by thou shalt not kill when it came to you personally. <laughs> right? If I'm not going to be led by the Spirit, you'd prefer it if I was impacted by thou shalt not commit adultery with your spouse. Huh? Don't speak derogatorily of the law. What has happened is the law that was given to curb sin unsuccessfully because man's nature was still not right. Has all of it has been fulfilled in being led by the Spirit. If I'm led by the Holy Spirit internally, even if I didn't know thou shalt not kill, I won't kill you because the Spirit of God's going to check me about that. Right? And love is the fulfilling of the law. It's not that we, we had the law and now we got nothing. Now we're just no restraint. Everything's fine. We're sorry we miss it all the time, but it ain't no big deal because it's already covered anyway. No. It's been replaced by a superior way of living. Instead of living by the laws and the regulations, we're living by the continual inside guidance of the Spirit who spoke those things. And if we let Him lead us, It'll be a high and a holy life. It'll be a victorious life. No, you don't have to sin every day. No, you don't. Don't believe that. You can go, you can go months at a time and not sin. Jesus went his entire life. <laughs> He's our hero, huh? <laughs> Somebody say, go Jesus. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm taking my time. Is that all right? Thank you, Lord. It's not my intention to get into a bunch of things that uh, we don't need to, but go to Galatians, please. Tell you what, on your way there, stop by 2 Corinthians. <laughs> let me give you, while you're turning to 2 Corinthians, let me give you a good scripture of what I just got through telling you, a reference about that. You might just want to put it in your notes. John 9, 41, Jesus said, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Just more scripture to, to, to verify what is sin. Violation of light. 
violation of what you see, violation of what you know. Which is why you have to walk in the light of what you have to be condemnation free. In 2 Corinthians, he described, and, and let me just ask you to be, make sure we're all on the same page. Is 2 Corinthians written to us? Would you agree? Hmm? Believers. Part of the same church. Okay. 2 Corinthians 7 and 8. Spirit of God through Paul says, Though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. One of the, the sources of confusion has been that there's been no differentiation between a godly sorrow for missing it and the sorrow of the world that works death. There's been no differentiation between the works of the law for justification or the works of faith to accomplish God's plan and will. As we talked about earlier, you don't just take a truth and make it the only truth. How do you rightly divide the word of truth? With other truths. They're all true. It's all right. And when your understanding of this truth is right, it agrees with these others. But you see, when it's not right, it doesn't agree with whole passages of Scripture, with half of epistles. So you have to come up with a way to get rid of them. And saying, that's not written to us. That's not for us nowadays. He said, Godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. In Galatians, if you're headed over that way, we're about to get to some exciting parts of this. You ready? What will the truth do for you? Make you free. In Galatians, without reading it in the fifth chapter, he talks about the spirit and the flesh. Is Galatians to us? Is that to, to believers? Born again believers? Oh, yeah, yeah. He said the spirit lusts and pulls against the flesh, and the flesh lusts and pulls against the spirit. And you, Romans talks a bit this, and you can't, you can't do the things that you would. You can't just do whatever your flesh wants to do. And, and there'll be, your flesh will try to hinder what your spirit knows you should do. All of us got this same situation. So if I yield to the flesh, and he mentions some of the manifestations of the, uh, the fruit of the flesh, Adultery, fornication, getting upset, mad, angry. I mean, it goes on and on. What if I do one of those? Is it possible for a born-again, tongue-talking, Bible-believing, CD, DVD-watching? <laughs> huh? Impact meeting going. Believer. To yield to the flesh and do stuff you know you shouldn't have done. Is it possible? So the big question here is then, what do I do? What is my response? Do I say, let me give you a couple of scenarios here. Do I say, I, uh, I lied, stole, cheated, whatever it was I did, but you know God knew I was going to lie and steal, and he already paid the price. Jesus already paid the price for my lying and stealing and really he don't even see it. So, no big deal. Huh? All I need to do is get rid of my memory of it. <laughs> That's all I need to do and I'll be free. 
What if you try that with your spouse? Are you brother or are you sister? Does it work good with them that way? Say, look, hey, you knew I was human. <laughs> you knew I could do stuff. Come on, don't act surprised. <laughs> and beside that, God's already forgiven me, and you have to forgive me too, so, hey, let's just quit talking about this. <laughs> huh? Is that right? Is that right? No repentance required. Because the Lord knew. He saw it. Jesus paid for it. It's done. See, if you take that to its ultimate end, if we are saved by grace alone, nothing to do with us, then everybody's going to be saved. Because Jesus paid for the price of the whole world, the sins of the whole world. Right? And if, if, if it's got no, nothing to do with it, whether they believe it or receive it, repentance has got nothing to do with it, then faith is not a factor. And we it is all God. And it has nothing to do with us. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the Bible teaches. Or I can get in the ditch on the other side of the road, which is where a lot of people have been, which is why they've been looking for something else. I missed it. I knew better. And the enemy will come immediately and go, you are a pitiful excuse for a Christian. You've done, how many times have you done this now? And if you go, yeah, I know. I know. I'm not fit to do this and I'm not fit to do that and if you start in beating on yourself the enemy will say here uh, take my hammer <laughs> and he'll take your little hammer and put a sledgehammer in your hand and between him and you you will become convinced I am good for nothing I am unredeemable I'm, I'm not couldn't be used again couldn't be restored I'm a failure and that is not having faith in the blood. I've had people look at me and say, yeah, but preacher, you, you don't know what I've done. And I said, yeah, and you don't know how powerful the blood is. No matter what you've done, as heinous as it could be. Have you, have you ever read in some of the, uh, even the Old Testament, have you ever read about Manasseh, King Manasseh? You talk about an evil guy evil. I mean evil personified. The Bible said he exceeded the evil stuff that the, uh, the, the heathen nations uh, uh, around them were kicked out for. One of his things was burning babies. Burning babies alive. And when judgment began to come on him and his kingdom he repented in dust and ashes. And God forgave him and told him because he repented and humbled himself, judgment wouldn't come in his time. Say what? <laughs> oh, friend, repentance, the gift of repentance is some of the sweetest music your ears have ever heard. Is that right? 1 Corinthians 11, does anybody remember what it says? If you'll judge yourself, come on, help me out, saints. If you'll judge yourself, 1 Corinthians 11, what is it, 30, 31, 32 through there? If you'll judge yourselves, you will not be judged. Is he right in the Christians? It starts off saying to the saints at Corinth. Christians, it's like us. Are there times you need to judge yourself? Yes, there are. When you, when you violated light, you don't wallow in sin. You don't go for the next three weeks or the next day saying I'm so unworthy, I'm so no good. That's acting like the blood has no power. You're the washed or you're not. 
You're either clean or you're not. You're either made righteous or you're not. But at the same time, you don't want to act like you didn't see what you saw and you didn't violate what you violated. You don't want to try to act with God like you didn't know. You come to Him humbly. Is everybody listening? Sincerely. You confess or you acknowledge what you did. You say, well, Jesus already paid for it. I know He did, but you need to receive it. You need to receive what He, and if you didn't do anything, there's nothing to receive for. Come on, can you see this? There's deception is if you could try to act like I didn't do anything and you know you did, which is what that chapter talks about. And you don't make excuses. You don't blame it on anybody else. You say, Lord, I missed it. Father, I, I, I know it's paid for, but you know that I know that I knew better and I violated light and I'm not going to treat the blood of the lamb that it took to save me and wash me as a light thing. So this is not a light thing. And what the Bible say, if you do that, you confess it, he is what? Faithful and just to what? Forgive us and what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, standing again full and clean, hallelujah, by the blood of the Lamb. So well, nothing we do could affect our righteousness. If we're righteous by faith in what he's done, then if it affects our faith, it affects our righteousness. You may have to chew on that a little bit. If it affects our faith, if you no longer believe you are, it affects it. Friend, breakthroughs come. Listen to that text again before I share the rest of this. That, that the Lord would grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the enemy. Breakthroughs, big breakthroughs come when you repent and believe. There are a lot of Christians, they wouldn't come right out and say it, but they're miffed at God. They're frustrated about how things are. They're disappointed in what has happened bad or what didn't happen good. They're annoyed. And this is pride. And this is unbelief. Because even if you don't voice it, there's something in you that's thinking, God, where are you? Why'd you let this? Why didn't you do this? And this is something to be repented for. That questioning of his character can hinder you from the much needed grace. Who gets the grace? God resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Hallelujah. Well, see, when you're, when you're standoffish, you got, uh, I got questions I need answered. No, you got attitude you need to lose. <laughs> well, this wish God would tell me something. <laughs> you probably couldn't handle it. I'm serious. If he told you, you probably wouldn't know what he told you. In the beginning of the service, what were we singing? Anybody remember what we were singing? How great you are. How vast his wisdom is. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. 
I've asked the Lord things before, sincerely. And he answered me. Ten years later. I'm serious. I, I prayed and I asked and I got nothing on it and I got nothing on it. And days passed and months passed. And of course after years you're not thinking about it every day. And uh, ten years later I'm just going about my business doing something else. And all at once he starts talking to me about it and showing it to me. And the moment he did I thought, no wonder you didn't tell me ten years ago. I would not have understood it. I wouldn't have known what you were talking about. When he calls us my little children, it's not a figure of speech. <laughs> uh, how many know two-year-olds can ask you questions? <laughs> Three-year-olds can ask you questions. You can't really answer them. If you sat down to me and explained it to them perfectly, they still wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about. They don't have enough life experience or perspective. And that's just with a few years. What about the endless ages between us and our Father Creator? I'm convinced. A lot of times when I, I come up with something I think is brilliant. <laughs> and I go, Lord, Lord. That he looks at it and it looks like the scroll, the crayon scrollings <laughs> of a little kid. <laughs> but he looks at it and goes, oh, that's pretty, baby. That's, that's pretty. <laughs> Maybe next time you could stay in the lines a little, a little, a little better. You don't want to discourage us. And it's, it's okay to ask questions. And it's okay to want to know. It's not okay to ask them accusatively. Because this is violating the one thing. He said it is impossible to please him with that. And that is trust. Faith, which is trust. Job is the perfect picture of this. The whole book of Job. It appears Job and his three friends were completely unaware of the devil. They had no, they had no awareness of his existence. Which wouldn't be too far-fetched they're not born again. They don't have the name of Jesus. What do they need to know about it? So they attributed everything to God. And what happened, if you read the, the, the passage, Job got upset with God. And he judged God. You say, what? Oh yeah, it's happening all over the planet. That's right, people are judging God. What are they judging him? Unfaithful? Uncaring? All, any number of things. Remember Romans talks about uh, that you may be righteous when you are judged. There will be people that will try to judge him. Oh, but when it's seen and when it's known what the truth is, every mouth will be silenced. And God will be shown to have been completely fair and just and good. Do you believe it or not? Yes. You need to make up your mind right now. I trust Him. I believe in Him. I believe in His justice and His fairness and His faithfulness and His goodness. Job let his experiences and his problems shake him. And he began to make accusations against God. And he began to tell him, God, I've done this and I've done that. And it's not right. And look what you do. You let the wicked do. And what about me? And, and why this? And why was I even born? And he's hurting. You can, you can relate to him. He's lost his kids. He's lost his health. His wife is standing there saying, curse God and die. And let's get this over with. The man's hurting. But 
It's not right for him to question God accusedly. Why, God? Why? That's not okay at all. Ever. Especially for people like us <laughs> that God's done things for. And we know He has. Why'd you let my husband die? See, that's, that's not just asking for information. There's hurt in that voice. There's bitterness in that voice. Why didn't you heal him? What about my wife? Lord, why'd you let my wife leave me? God, I did everything I knew how to do. I prayed. Why, God? People quit going to church. They quit praying. They quit reading their Bible. What's wrong in this situation? Anybody with me? What's this person? The enemy is feeding these people lies. And with, if he comes right out and says it or not, the implication is if God really loved you, He'd have done this or that or not let this. If God was really faithful to you, after all you did for Him and you were there and you were a good Christian and you were, this is the devil. Come on, are you listening, saints? The truth is, God doesn't owe us anything. Nothing. He doesn't owe us another breath. He doesn't owe us another step. Everything he gave us was a free gift. Completely undeserved or unearned. That's what grace is. He doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe me anything because of what we've done. He told us if we'd obey him, he'd reward us. But there'll be times in life when things don't go the way you wanted them to. And when you won't know why. No maybe about it. There will be. You, me, all of us. I know reading the book of Job many years ago, it was a puzzle to me. And I'd look at it and i think, well, the question is, looking at what Job said and his three friends back and forth, why did this happen? That's what they're wrestling with. Job's a good man. And he was. God himself said he was. Why did these awful, awful things Happen to this good, good man. So they're trying to answer this. And they're wise men. And they're exhausting their knowledge and vocabulary and they're not coming up with answers. And So I kept reading it and I'm talking about year after year whenever I did. Why'd this happen? Why'd this happen? And I couldn't get the answer. Even when God came on the scene in the whirlwind and spoke, he didn't start off by saying, this is why it happened. He didn't even address that. Through the whole discourse. What he did say, because Job was saying, I wish God had talked to me. I wish he'd give me an audience. I got some questions for him. And I'd set my case before him and I'd tell him I'm righteous and what's happened to me is not fair. Basically what he's saying is, God, you've, you, your judgment's not right. You've perverted judgment. You, this is unfair. And I'm sure he never expected God himself to show up and say, basically, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, who wants to talk to me? Who is this that darkens counsel without knowledge? What does that mean? You're talking, but you don't know what you're saying. He said, you want to talk to me? Tell me. And he gave Job an opportunity. And Job just went, above, above, above. <laughs> he said, I've opened my mouth once, yea, twice. Now I'm going to lay my hand on my mouth right now. How many understand in the presence of such glory and power and wisdom, you'd become instantly more aware of how foolish you were? And then the Lord began to say, 
Where were you? You know how I did this? How does this work? Where did this come from? How did this happen? Anybody know Job's answer to all of those questions? Do you, do you know the answer? No. No. I don't know. No. I always wondered about that. No. I don't have a clue. No. Obviously, I was not there. No. No. I didn't even know that's what it was. No. No. And what the Lord said is, basically, if you can't answer these how are you going to judge me unfair concerning these judgments? It's like what we're saying. You don't understand addition. How can you talk to me about geometry? And Job repented. Is it true? Is it true? He repented in dust and ashes and this was the great breakthrough. Come on, can you see it? Say, it was the great breakthrough in Job's life. The enemy had him in a grip, had him in a vice. He couldn't see anything but death everywhere he looked. But just like that, when Job repented and believed, he's loosed. Hallelujah. And the Lord honored Job. He, said, he told his three friends, he said, look, if you'll get him to pray for you, I'll forgive you too. <laughs> They've been trying to straighten him out for the last 40 chapters. So now they got to go and say, uh, please, Mr. Job, would you pray for us? You got to watch the very people you judge be the same people you need help from later. I've seen it over and over. But that was when things broke, was when he stopped being angry at God, when he stopped questioning God, when he stopped accusing God, when he stopped feeling hurt, feeling bitter, and he realized, I'm the one who's wrong here. I need to repent. And he repented for feeling that way and saying those things. And the moment he did, grace flows to the low place. The proud and the haughty don't get it. But when you humble yourself, grace flows down. Hallelujah. And the Bible said people came to him and they brought money and the Lord healed him and gave him twice as much as what he lost. Come on, can you see it? Tell me what was the pivotal point when, when all this broke, when all this, when Job repented and believed. It's always been that way. It's not about law. It's not about discounting what Jesus has done. It's about you and I have a living relationship with him. Hmm? And I mean, no, even though you can have a legal relationship, that doesn't mean your fellowship is amazing all the time. Husbands and wives have found this out. You know, just because you're, you're still legally husband and wife, but you can feel like you're two states away from each other because of things that have been said, things that have been done. Doesn't mean they don't love you. Doesn't mean they're not still your, your spouse. How many know God loves us no matter what? And we're still his child. But that doesn't mean he's pleased with everything that we do. He knows when we're violating light. And we don't need to act like we don't know it. Do you know he knows what you know? Come, don't, don't run from him. Run to him. When hardships in life occur, you'll do one of the two. You'll either get hurt, bitter, and even though you don't admit it, you'll find fault with God and you'll judge him unfaithful and unrighteous. That's why you wouldn't leave him. Or, or, you'll just let it cause you to push in closer. Hmm? And let me tell you what to get you through the roughest places you could ever encounter in life. You, you may be crying. You may, you may be thinking, I don't even know what's going on anymore. I thought I knew, but I don't guess I did. Let me tell you what to get you through the roughest places you could ever be in. You look up 
through your tears and you say, God, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you in life. I'll trust you with my last breath. I trust you in life. I trust you in death. And you are faithful. I don't care what I see or what I feel. I call you faithful. Faithful. You've never failed me. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it feels like. There's just a whole lot of stuff I don't know. Hmm. But I trust you. And I'm with you. I'm going nowhere. It's me and you. From now on. I'm yours. You're my. Nothing will be able to separate me from your love. Hallelujah. And nothing will be able to pry away my love for you. I refuse to believe lies. In that place, you will find grace. Hallelujah. And you'll find that his grace is sufficient. It's enough and it's more than enough. Do you believe it, friends? And that's when these big breakthroughs happen. Like what happened with Job, what you've been struggling with and, and not able to get free from and, and, and failing to receive. It'll just clear up and you'll see it and you'll know it. How many know with enough grace, you can receive anything? With enough grace, you can overcome anything. With enough of his help. Hallelujah. Everybody stand with me, please. Singers and players, would you come? Let's minister to him. Let's worship him. I believe some things need to happen right now in the service before we go. Yes, thank you, Lord, for reminding me of that. Thank you. Before we do this, I was reminded. Is everybody listening, please? There was a number of people who left last night when the alarm came, went off and didn't come back. I'm concerned that there were some things they were supposed to get and, and didn't hear and didn't get. If that's you, please get the message from last night. Listen to it carefully. If they're not here but you know them, would you tell them what I said? Important. Very important. How many believe that your, your pastors and, and, and myself, we just do things off the top of our head? And ain't no big deal or, huh? Or do you reckon this whole meeting's been ordered of the Lord? And, and the other ministers that have ministered here and ourselves, I mean, I think there's been indications of it all along. Well, if it's the Lord, then we don't just want to treat it like it's the words of a man or a woman. Hallelujah. Just close your eyes. Just you Guys, y'all just go ahead and play whatever. Let's focus on Him. There are big breakthroughs that are right here. Hallelujah. Big breakthroughs. How are they going to come, saints? How are they going to come? That the Lord would grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the enemy. Hallelujah. Let's take these next few moments. Let's humble ourselves before our great God. Let's acknowledge His greatness. Let me lead you in a prayer. And then let's worship Him. And if, you, if you're able to, you want to get out on your knees or you want to step out and come, come to the altar. It's, that's good too. Repentance is right. Not a sorrowing of the world. There's death in that, like the world does. But a godly sorrow. Unto repentance. Unto deliverance. Unto life. Unto full restoration of fellowship. Not relationship. Your relationship was always there. But fellowship. There's nothing sweeter than full fellowship with the Father. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Knowing that there's nothing between you and him and that everything's right between you and he and you're walking in all the light you have and he knows it and he's pleased with you. Oh, the joy of his pleasure. In it is fullness of joy, fullness of life. Hallelujah. Sit out loud, Father God. Forgive me for questioning you, questioning your judgments, any feelings that weren't right, any coldness, any way that I've pulled away. I repent. That's wrong. I'm wrong to do it. You've never failed me. You've never been unfaithful to me. You've never let me down. And I confess, you are the faithful God. And I will trust you forever. You are completely righteous in everything you have done and everything you did not do. I just don't know a lot of these things. But I know that you do. And I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. Oh, begin to worship him. I trust you. Oh, my Lord, I trust you. I trust you. Oh, my Lord, I trust you. Hallelujah. Come on now, if you felt hard at God in the least, repent about it right now. You need to repent. Let it be a heart thing. Oh, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I trust you. Trust you. You are faithful, so faithful. You're righteous, righteous in all your ways. You're so faithful. Just and good in every way. And I trust you, oh my Lord, I trust you, trust you, oh I trust you, oh I trust you, I any wrong I don't believe you've ever left me alone without your help I would have long ago perished without your grace I would be gone I trust you oh my Lord I I will hold to you forever, cling to you, my God, hallelujah, 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 healings are here, miracles are here, financial breakthroughs are here. But if you've, if you've harbored ill feeling about any of these things, if you don't repent, you'll miss out. It'll come and go and you'll be left out. From your heart. From your heart. Acknowledge the truth. 
The truth is, he's right about everything. He's right about everything. He's fair about everything. Good and faithful in everything. Oh, lift your voice and praise Him. Praise Him in a new tongue. Worship Him. Oh, I worship You. Worship You. You're so holy. You're so worthy. Righteous. Everything you do, I worship you. I worship you. Oh, I worship you. Lord, I worship you. Hallelujah, oh hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. The Lord is healing. He's healing cancer in the stomach. Oh, somebody say thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. There are mighty breakthroughs for those that will repent. Said out loud, cancer, we curse you, command you to die, dry up, be gone in Jesus' name. Stomach, intestines, colon, be healed, be restored in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, let's worship him, saints. Miracles are happening right now. Miracles are happening right now. Oh, I praise you. Oh, I worship you. My Lord, my God, I worship you. Oh, I Worship you, worship you, worship you, worship you, worship you. Oh, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. He wants to lift you up, give you what you need. Humble yourself. Oh, cast aside the pride. Cast aside every hard feeling. Oh, the Lord knows our hearts. Oh, say, I humble myself. I humble myself. I humble myself before you. Oh, hallelujah. Om blessakeyede. Anjanengani fellow kodre. I humble myself. I humble myself. Hallelujah. 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 There's some folks need to admit, they need to acknowledge the truth. That a lot of what happened in that relationship where they left you, a lot of a lot of that was things you did. You need to acknowledge that. You need to repent for blaming God. And you need to repent for blaming it all on them too. There's healing here. For those that'll repent, there's deliverance, there's victory. I mean, be humble. It's, it's fine if a tear comes to your eye. Godly sorrow that works repentance not to be repented of. 
There's some that need to repent and acknowledge the truth that you didn't listen to what the Lord told you to do and that's why your business failed. Be upset with Him because you didn't do what He told you to do. It's dishonest. You need to repent and acknowledge I did some things He didn't tell me to do. And I didn't do some things He did tell me to do. That's my fault. That's not His fault. Acknowledge the truth and repent. There's breakthrough for you. God wants to add to you. Just like Job, He wants to add to you twice what you lost. Oh, you ought to be quick to repent. Quick to confess. Quick to believe. Quick to receive. Hallelujah. Oh, I worship you. Oh, Lord, my God, I worship you. Oh, I worship you. Oh, Lord, my God, I worship you. And I'll trust you, Lord, forever. I will trust you still. No matter what I see or don't see or understand, I will trust you still. Oh, you are faithful. Tell him out loud, you're faithful. Oh, Lord, I say you're faithful. Oh, Lord, my God, you're faithful. Hallelujah. Listen just a moment. I just close your eyes in a worshipful spirit. Brother Hagen, Brother Kenneth Hagen Sr. Tells of how his sister became ill and was diagnosed with a terminal disease. And how he prayed for her and fasted for her everything he knew to do but she got worse and got worse and she died and it bothered him but not long after the Lord allowed him an experience where he was caught up to heaven and he saw her he said she looked so beautiful so radiant so glorious they embraced they rejoiced and then he said to, she looked at him and said Ken this is her brother you know don't feel bad you couldn't pray the prayer of faith for me there was a reason why and that was the end of it And that's the truth of the number of people here. You did your best. You did everything you knew to do. It didn't work out the way you knew it was God's perfect will to work out. And the enemy will come and say, see there, nothing to that faith stuff. And God, if He is real, if He does exist, He's way off somewhere and hardly even knows what goes on on this little puny planet couldn't be bothered with what's going on in your life. Lies, 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 lies. God never left you. Somebody say, He never left me. He never, he, Lord, I acknowledge you have never left. You said you would never leave me. You would never forsake me. You will never let me go. You never have. You never will. And what those dear ones that are in heaven, they're not on the earth anymore, what they would tell you is the same thing. They would say, dear one, don't feel bad. Don't feel bad about that. There was a reason why. 
Well, what's the reason? Some of it's between them and the Lord, and it's none of your business. But what you can know of a certainty is God did not let you down. And when you find out what reasons you do find out, you're going to shake your head and go, Oh, Lord, I, I should have never doubted you. I should have never questioned you. You were more merciful than I would have asked you to be. You were more faithful than I even knew. So just tell him now by faith. Oh, I'm telling you, it's music to your father's ears. When his child in such imperfect understanding, only by faith, reaches up and says, Father, I trust you. Daddy, I totally trust you. Hallelujah. Oh, okay, son, Namaji. Say it again, Daddy. I trust you. I completely trust you. I totally trust you. Oh, hallelujah. Mangala said. 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 I will trust you no matter what I see or feel. I will trust in you no matter what is understood or not revealed. I will trust you. You are faithful still. Hallelujah. The Lord is healing stomachs, I'm telling you. Stomachs, intestines, colons, bladders are being healed supernaturally. The anointing of God is working inside these bodies. As you humble yourself, grace flows. From the throne, the throne of grace, we find grace to help in the time of need, but it only flows to the humble. The humble. Hallelujah. Right, Y'all have that young, uh, young man, young boy, whoever, come up to the front. Have him come up. Hallelujah. The Lord's healing. Hallelujah. Just have him stand right over here for just a moment. Hearts are being healed. Oh, somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Put your hand on on your chest and just join in faith with those that need this. Palpitations. Irregular heartbeat. Heart be, be normal. Fall back into a correct rhythm and lock into it and be normal and serve them well their whole life long. In Jesus' name, everybody say, hearts be corrected. Hearts be healed. Hearts be normal. Work perfectly in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Now don't forget the key to all this. Humbling yourself. Repent of any doubt and unbelief. Repent of any hard feelings against the Lord or against His people. Well, they didn't help me. They didn't help me. They did, you need to repent for that. Repent for that. Who said they owed you anything? They could have done this or they could have. You need to hush. You need to repent because that's blocking your blessing. It's holding you out. Oh, I see it. I see it. 
Everybody put your hands on your head. There are numerous problems in the head, with the brain. Some things are known, some things are not known. Severe headaches, migraines, pressure, pressure on the eyes. But then there are a number of things that you, you, people have no awareness of. But there needs to be repentance. Say it out loud, I forgive anybody and everybody that has done any wrong against me. Just like God has forgiven me, I forgive them. I hold nothing against them. They owe me nothing. No apology. No explanation. They owe me nothing. I repent for judging them and being bitter. Hallelujah. Now there's grace. That's right. Hallelujah. I speak to these brains. I speak to these heads. Grace to you. Grace to you, brain cells. Grace to you, brain stem. Grace to you. O kale sande banea jafaya roktea celebre mandi banek zade onange. Plants that the Heavenly Father has not planted be dissolved, be removed in Jesus' name. Parts that have been depressed and damaged be filled back up, be restored. I speak to you, grace to you in the ha 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 in the name of Jesus. In the name, come on, let's worship Him, saints. Let's be humble before Him. Let's worship Him. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, I join my faith with this one. Amen. Lord, let your healing anointing and virtue and power go into them and drive away and out everything that ought not be there. Be healed, be restored, and live in Jesus' name. Live in the name of the Most High. Que davanose, que davanose, que Close, please. Don't don't look at me. I'm not. I'm not the answer. There's a number who have gotten bitter and upset because somebody didn't give you a place that you thought they were supposed to. You said, "Well, in in, in your heart and mind, this is what God wants, and this is what's supposed to happen," but. They didn't do it, and they they haven't haven't done it, and don't act like they ever will do it. That's haughtiness. That's pride to be repented of. You're not the only one who hears from God. Is it not possible? You could have missed it. You could have just got something in your head. But because of that, there's been many hindrances in your life. Things have been hard. There's been lack. There's been problems. Oh, there's a breakthrough. There's a breakthrough right here. Right now. If you'll just repent. 
Everybody said out loud, Lord, they're not my servant. They're your servant. I don't know what you told them to do or didn't tell them to do. And I acknowledge, I don't know everything. I could have missed it. I could have assumed something. I repent for pride, haughtiness, bitterness, judging. I repent. That means change. And I receive. I receive. I receive. I receive joy of my salvation. I receive peace that passes understanding. Oh, say, I receive. I receive. I believe and I receive everything you give to me. I receive. I receive. Breakthroughs, healings, deliverances, liberty, hips are being healed. Oh, somebody say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hips are being healed. There's been pain. Oh, man, it, it, it's hurt when you walk. It's, it hurts when you walk. But you need to acknowledge God hadn't let me down. God hadn't God hadn't left me out. Somebody tell him, I trust you, Lord, I trust you. You've, you've never failed me. And you, you've never been late, and you never will be late. You've never ignored me and, and, and not cared about me. Never have, never will. Hips be healed. Hip joints be restored. Bones become strong again. Marrow come alive in Jesus' name. Nerves be revived. Joints be restored. The cushion come back again. The cushion comes back again. Hallelujah. Fluid and the sinew and the cushion comes back again. Hallelujah. And the pressure comes off the nerve. And the peace comes into your hips and into your knees and into your ankles and into your feet. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody say, I receive. I receive. I believe that I receive. I receive. I receive. I believe that I receive. I receive. I receive. I believe that I receive. I receive. I call you faithful. I call you faithful. I call you faithful. Somebody say, I call you faithful. As a young woman, Sarai became bitter because she couldn't conceive the great desire of her heart. She blamed her husband, Abraham. She blamed God. And year after year, she was bitter. Even when she decided, here's a way it can happen in a roundabout way and gave Hagar and Ishmael was born. And after that, she's more bitter than ever. But the Bible said there came a time. 
She's got her own verse in Hebrews 11. And you know what it says? She judged God faithful. Oh, somebody say faithful. 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 And her bitterness went away. And her hardness went away. And her womb came alive. And her body began to thrive. And a miracle was conceived. Because she did believe. God was faithful. Somebody say faithful. Say, I call you faithful. I call you faithful. Oh, Lord, I call you faithful. Come on, let's worship him some more, saints. Good things are happening. Faithful. Oh, Lord, I call you faithful. Listen, just keep worshiping the Lord, but listen, just keep your eyes closed. More than one person, more than one young person, I'm seeing a young woman. And truth be told, you felt hard at the Lord because that young man that you fell in love with, you did not get to be your husband. And you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you cried your heart out. And why God? And you hurt. And it's real. But I want you to know, sister girl, God was being good to you. You don't know it yet. But in not too many days from now, you're going you're gonna to cry with tears or joy. God, you are faithful. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I, I thought that was it. I thought that was everything that could ever be. But that's just because you're so young and don't know. You're going to find out. There's more. <laughs> oh, you're going to laugh and you're going to cry tears of joy. You're going to say, oh, God, you're so good to me. Oh, God, you've been so faithful to me. But you know what would please him the most? Is if you'd say it now before you see or feel any difference if you'd push those hurt feelings aside and you'd tell him right now, I call you faithful. Come on, say it out loud. Faithful. 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 Oh Lord my God, I call you faithful. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. Lord, I call you faithful. Oh, somebody needs to tell him, faithful. Oh, Lord, I call you faithful. I call you faithful. Oh, Lord, I call you faithful. Faithful, Lord. Faithful, Lord. Faithful, Lord. Faithful, Lord. Faithful, Lord. The Lord is healing skin conditions. Ha, ha, ha. Skin conditions. Some things have been chronic. You've had for years and you've treated it with this and treated it with that. In the name of Jesus, every rash, every outbreak, every swelling, every inflammation, the excessive dryness and, and flaking and psoriasis and 
every kind of thing. We command that to stop in Jesus' name and leave and be gone. And we say, flesh become as the flesh of a little child. Become healthy and supple and sound and soft in Jesus' name. Be healed. Hallelujah. Everybody say, I receive. I receive. I believe that I receive. Oh Lord, I take it now. Say, I believe that I receive. Lord, I take it now. I call you faithful. You're the faithful God forever and always. Faithful, and I trust you. I refuse to doubt you. I refuse to question your judgments. I refuse to doubt your goodness. I refuse to listen to lies against you or about you. Lord, I trust you. And I always will. Everybody say, Lord, I trust you. And I always will. Sing it with me, everybody. Lord, I trust you. And I always will. trust you and I always will oh you're so faithful you're so just and good and kind so merciful oh you're so good you're so good doesn't matter what I see or don't see you're still good no matter what I feel or don't feel you're still good what I understand or don't understand you're still good you're still good sing it again Lord I trust you And I always from your heart directly to your Father. Lord, I trust you. And I always sing it to him again. Father, I trust you. And I Father, I completely trust you, and I always I trust you. I trust you. Oh, this pleases him, saints. This pleases him greatly. Uh -huh. he said no one ever trusted in me and was let down or made ashamed <laughs> he says you just wait and see child what I have for you oh hallelujah hallelujah Hallelujah. 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 Worship you. Oh, we worship.
worship you. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. Now, Father, we just thank you tonight for all that's been imparted to us. Lord, help us not to let these things slip. Help us to leave knowing what's the next thing. That not, not 2,000 things, but there's always a next step of obedience for each one of us that you've spoken to us about that will lead us and guide us and take us into many other areas. But Lord, help every one of us to leave this place with saying, tomorrow when I wake, I will be thus and so because you told me to. I will, I will walk in the light that, that you've given me in that area that you've, that you've pierced my heart about tonight. Thank you for protecting me. Thank you for warning me. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for a repentance that brings us to life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for any all and all correction that you've given us. Thank you. For whom you love, you correct. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. We are so grateful for your presence. Lord, we don't take lightly what you've, what you've imparted to us. So many in this world are without the light of the Word of God. And oh, how abundantly we've heard this week. What an honor. What an honor, sir. What an honor that you would so, so grace and enrich us with your presence and with your Word and with gifts that you've put into the kingdom such as these. We are so thankful for that. We so honor you for that. And Father, we just are so, so grateful. And I pray you're that each, each and every one of us will walk in the light as he's in the light. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, oh man, oh man. Was this something? Woo! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Hey, you can be seated. In a moment, I'm going to have uh, Pastor Steve come up and dismiss us. But uh, And then I'm going to ask, as he does, the worship team, y'all just play something real happy. <laughs> worship, just worship God real loud and uh, praise Him with everything you've got. Thank you so much for coming to Impartation, and uh, we love you so much. And